Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, today, we're going to be out, uh, studying out of James chapter 4. So let's just jump right into it. James says, those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and you do not have it, so you commit murder. You covet something and you cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly. In order to spend what you get on your pleasures, adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or you, do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scripture says God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell within us. But he gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. You know, many of us might be thinking about all the conflicts and disputes among us today. You know, we can try to distract ourselves uh, looking to, uh, to sports or to, to our phones or to um, some other outlet to ignore the conflicts and disputes among us. But the reality is there are conflicts and disputes among us today, whether they're political disputes or, uh, di or arguments about how to uh, address the deep racial wound in our country how to address some of the, the spiritual issues at work um, amongst our people, how to um, um, confront the issues that we face in daily life. All of the, the time of coronavirus, all of the time of job loss and of family strain, uh, of um, this political season and of, of the... Um, different realities that we have yet to wrestle with um, have bubbled up to the surface in a lot of conflicts and disputes. And what I hear many of us saying and what I, uh, what I hear many of us longing to know is where did this, all this come from? Where did we go wrong? Where did things uh, become so divisive? And what James does is not answer us uh, outright. There's always things that we need to address for our context and for our time and for our history. Um, but he does point to um, the overarching issue. Where do these disputes and conflicts um, come from? They come from within. They come from uh, what what kind of life and allegiance we have pledged, whether it's to the world or to Christ. The, the cravings that are at war within us, the craving to be selfish, to know, to have what we want, to get what we desire, to have uh, our, our dreams come true, our power realized, our powers held on to, um, all those desires come out from within us in actions. So it's not that we just want something and do not have it, but we're willing to hurt each other for it. The, the conflict that leads to um, violence against our neighbor 
James describes it as committing murder. Um, Jesus points out that underneath murder, we also ought not to lash out against a brother or sister or call uh, a, a brother or sister uh, derogatory terms uh, and names uh, because any, any measure of devaluing life lies under the, the, the command of God not to commit murder. So why do we see all this violence amongst ourselves? Uh, because we want what we do not have. We have a desire to want what we want. And so we get it by our means, the means of the world's values, which says um, we're most important. And so our neighbor becomes less important. And that's what leads to violence. Not just physical violence, but emotional violence, um, spiritual violence, even manifesting into murder. Under that umbrella of do not kill lies all human life. And what we see in these days is human life being devalued. Of our brothers and sisters of color, their lives being devalued. Um, and what James reckons with is that that division, those deep racial wounds, those deep wounds that we know in other areas of our lives don't come out of nowhere. They're not just the, the, the surface level fruit that we see uh, being produced. They, have, they are rooted in the world's values, the values that, that say we want what we want and we're most important. So our neighbor is secondary. He goes on to give other examples. You covet, which is like a... a, a you know, jealousy on steroids, you want what others have and you don't want or that you don't have. And so you go out and you try to take it from them. So you engage in disputes and conflicts in order to get um, what you want. And I think that that might sound odd to us, right? We covet something and cannot obtain it. And yet usually when we think of what we covet and we can't obtain for ourselves, Usually that, that comes out in stealing things. I want somebody else's car that I don't have, so I go out and steal that car. But James gives a, uh, an important um, description of what, uh, what kind of action this comes out in. We engage in disputes and conflicts. And, uh, and so covetousness, jealousy, um, wanting what we don't have, doesn't always look physical. Sometimes it looks like wanting power that we don't have, wanting influence that we don't have, wanting validation and attention that we don't have, that we see others have, and we want it. So we engage in disputes and conflicts so that we can prove that ourselves that we're right or and that others are wrong and that we're important and our neighbor is less. And, and it is... Out of this that I think we see the conflicts and disputes among us today. These things don't come out of nowhere. We didn't just wake up one day and decide, you know what, we're going to be divisive. We're going to have conflict. But after a while, with, uh, with the things that we welcome in, the desires that we allow to shape us, the the wants and desires that we allow to drive us toward action. When we want what we want more than what God wants, and what we love is not what God loves, and what we choose to do is not what God wants us to do, it manifests itself not in just a belief system that is uh, contrary to what God wants, but in a action, in a lifestyle that is contrary to what God wants. These conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? They come from within. They come from what we have bound ourselves to. And if there, if there is a better description of sin, I don't know where it is, than to see that what we love, when we love ourselves more than God and, and more than neighbor, what is produced out of us is death. 
what is produced out of us is conflict and dispute. What is produced out of us does not look like faith, hope, and love, but quite the opposite. It looks like um, it looks like fear. It looks like despair. It looks like conflict and mistrust. And so we don't get what we desire. That's the irony, right? That's the irony that James points out in what, what, uh, what sin leads to, is that um, when we are bound to our selfishness, then what comes out is, a, is actions that try to seek after what we want and what we desire. But the irony is, is that when we live like that, always grasping for what we want first, we don't get what we, what we need. We don't get what we want. All we gain is emptiness then. So James says you do not have because you do not ask. You do not ask or you ask. And, you know, he kind of anticipates that when people uh, hear, uh, you know, you don't have because you don't ask. He anticipates that some of us might be like, but I do ask. I do pray for those things. I do pray for those things that I want. And James has a follow-up, and he says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. And we might scratch our heads and say, well, what if we ask God for what we want, then how can we ask correctly, James? We, when we pray for what we want, when we ask and desire for what we want, how we, how we do so should not land on gaining our, for our own selves. I wonder how many preachers of the prosperity gospel today have read James, frankly. I'm not sure how many of them have read it seriously, because I'm not sure you can read this and think, God is there to give me what I want. I think James repeatedly hits this on the head and says, no, God is there to form you into the person that you're supposed to be. God is there to, to change you into the kind of person that he, he desires for you, the life he desires for you to have, which doesn't look like gaining what we want and doesn't look like gaining some sort of superficial power or uh, superficial wealth. If anything, it's quite the opposite. Jesus says the first will be the last. Jesus demonstrates for us the poor are the ones who are blessed. Those who don't have these physical things binding them to the selfishness, it is when we are faithful, when we look to God, when we are married to God in righteousness, that's when we get what we need. When God is first and our neighbor is loved. That is when we get what we need. That is when we get what we ask for, when our desire matches that of God, who desires most of all for you to love God with your whole heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And as in any relationship, when you're married, when you're, uh, even when you're dating or even when you're in a strong friendship, when you just look for yourself, you're not going to gain love in that relationship. When it's just for you, that's not what love is. When you're just seeking out for your pleasure and for your fulfillment and for your, um, and for your desire, you're not going to gain what you're asking for. You're not going to have a strong relationship with that friend or that loved one or that, or, or that spouse. And you're not even going to gain what you ask for. I can't tell you how many times that I have heard husbands or wives who have cheated on each other or who have cheated on, another, or on their spouse come back and say, now I don't trust them. Because I've engaged in the mistrust, because I have 
done or have broken this trust. Now it's broken in me. So what they've tried to do is seek out after their pleasure and come back uncertain. <laughs> they didn't come back with a, a stronger relationship or a stronger uh, image of themselves or even a stronger fulfillment, but with less fulfillment, with more anxiety. That's what mistrust and brokenness does. That's what selfishness does. That's what putting ourselves first does. And so that's why, um, along with a long, lot of scriptures in the Bible, um, James um, uses the analogy of marriage or an analogy of a relationship to point out what sin ultimately does. Sin is not about what we've done wrong and uh, doing what is right. A sin, sin is ultimately a broken relationship with God and a broken relationship with other people. And so ultimately we have cheated on our creator and cheated on each other. We are adulterers because we have sought our own passions and desires above others and above God. And so he says, do you not know that friendship with the world is breaking that relationship up with God? So whoever wants to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that God says he is jealous for us? That his desire is for an exclusive relationship with us. Our brokenness is not due to a deficiency in God. God has held up God's end of the relationship, but we have sought friendship on the side with other lifestyles, with other realities, with sin. So, by desiring what we want first, we don't get it. And by desiring what we want first, we live in brokenness, brokenness of relationship with God and with others. A short side note, just so we don't get confused. When it says, that friendship with the world is enmity with God, it means that friendship with the world's values, friendship with the ways of the world, with the value systems that lead to this selfishness, that is putting ourselves as an enemy of God and at the foot of the cross, looking up as an accuser of Jesus as he lays there, as he is there, on the cross dying. It places us on the other side of the injustice. What it doesn't mean is that we don't engage in the world, that we don't have non-Christian friends, or that we don't try to um, engage seriously in um, seeking after uh, justice in our society um, uh, and advocating for the poor among us. Being friends with people in the world is not what this is talking about. Being friends with the ways of the world that lead to those injustices and lead to poverty. That is what James is saying. Do not be married to those things. Because you will break in your relationship with God and with your neighbor. Paul, uh, The Apostle Paul puts it this way. You are in the world, but you are not of it. You're in the world, and so you're engaged in the world. And so you are, as Jesus tells us, quite simply, supposed to serve the poor and uh, advocate for people who are being oppressed uh, and, and um, visit the sick and, and the dying and the prisoner because that's the kinds of things that Jesus did. And when you do those kinds of things, you're, it's as if you're doing them for Jesus. And I think people find themselves in those situations and in the brokenness of the world because the value system that we have, because the way, the things that we value, the things that we love point back to ourselves and not to our neighbor. Why do you think that there's poverty in the world? Why do you think that there are so many people who are willing to do whatever it takes to get the, to get the next dime or the next buck? Uh, even things that are illegal, what do you think drives people to cheat on their spouse, 
to lash out against a neighbor. It is that selfishness. It is that messed up relationship that the, that creation now has because of sin, where God, where we put ourselves above God and above our neighbor. But here's the good news. While we might look around ourselves and say, there's lots of conflicts and disputes. And while it is a, uh, it's really important that we look inside of ourselves and say, what have we done to be friends with this system that, that oppresses people and that breaks our relationship with God and with our neighbor? We also serve a God who is able to meet our brokenness with grace. God yearns jealously for a relationship with us that we might be restored, that we might be his, and that he might be our God and we might be his people. And while in the world right now, it might, not, it might seem like there's so much wrong and there's so much sin and there's so many things, even in ourselves, that are broken, but God can fix that. God can heal the brokenness. God can forgive every sin, God can give grace that it far exceeds the level of sin that we have. God opposes the proud, but God gives grace to the humble. So what do we do? We who have, are sinners and all people are sinners and have fallen short of the glory of God, we become humble. And we say, what God desires, we want. What God has done, we will receive in Christ. And we will relinquish of our sins and follow him. He has the power to forgive you of your sins. He has the power to lead you on the path of righteousness, that you might resist the devil, that you, he might flee from you, that you might walk in a life that loves your neighbor and loves God with your whole heart. But this grace that is freely given to you is not cheap. It was not cheaply offered because God died for it and rose from the dead in victory for it, that you might receive it. And you can't receive it without changing. You can't receive it without humbly going to God and saying, I have sinned against you and against my neighbor. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of my transgressions. Jesus is Lord. I will follow him. And maybe that's a prayer you're ready to pray today. Maybe that's something that you want to, you want to know more about. I am always here. I am always around uh, to talk about that with you. Um, and maybe it's something you need to think more about. Don't feel rushed in it. But just know that when the wrong seems so strong, we cannot bear it. God is the ruler yet. God will always be there to meet us in our brokenness and give us grace. And so today, as we pray, we recognize that the wrong in the world is deep. And it, the things that we have done personally, nationally, worldwide, God does not accept. And God will not stand for it to remain. God is bringing the world to rights and will set things right where there is no more mourning or weeping or gnashing of teeth or, or pain anymore. But we need to mourn today that we have found ourselves on the uh, giving end of some tears and some pain for our brothers and sisters of color, for our neighbors and friends and our enemies that we have wronged, 
And we need to humbly come to the Lord and say, we have not loved God with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. But thanks be to God that he can cleanse the thoughts of our hearts through, the, through faith in the Lord Jesus, that we might perfectly love him and worthily magnify his holy name through Christ our Lord. That is good news for a world in need and for a people like you and me who need redemption and need forgiveness. We can go to him and we can find grace that is greater than all of our sin. Go in his grace and peace today. We love you. We're praying for you. If there's anything you ever need, if there's anything, any questions you ever have about Jesus, about the church, about faith, about your walk with God, or just about anything, I am here. Your church family is here. Stay safe. Be blessed. God go with you and bless you and follow you and lead you toward love and good deeds. Go in his grace and peace today.